think that people need to know what really happened. I'm not a cold-blooded killer. I am not a murderer. That experience will probably be with me, you know, the rest of my life. police station in Prince George's County. Every day it's business as usual here. People file complaints, officers process and book suspects. To look at it, it's an ordinary building. But 12 years ago, a very extraordinary event occurred here, one that left three traumatized families in its wake. Very early on the morning of June 26, 1978, a 15-year-old Bladensburg boy, Terrence Johnson, and his brother Melvin were on their way to the movies they never got there. Instead, they were brought here by county police who thought that Melvin may have been a suspect in a laundry room break-in. And before the sun would rise that day, two officers, Albert Claggett IV and James Bryan Swart, would be dead. Terrence Johnson was charged. I had just came back from Bush Gardens. Um, I spent the weekend with my friend and his mother had taken us to Bush Gardens and she brought us back uh, Sunday and I had convinced her to bring me home early. I wasn't supposed to come home until Monday and when I got home my youngest brother and my next year oldest brother they were the only two home. My mother was out working and I washed clothes and I called my girlfriend and we started to talk on the phone and next thing I know my brother, my oldest brother Melvin, he knocked at the door and he came in, he seemed a little anxious, he seemed excited uh, he wanted to wake my other two brothers up, but uh, he decided not to. And I thought it was, you know, ideal for him to be there because it gave me an opportunity to, to get out of the house to go see my girlfriend. I tried to convince her to let me come pick her up. She was grounded and uh, she couldn't leave the house. So we decided to just go to a drive-in movie. And Queen's Chapel was like, you know, it's a social event for young people during that time because they had bleachers. When their parents would take them to the drive-in, uh, we would all sit on the bleachers and talk, and that's where you met a lot of different people at. So we had intended to go to Queen's Chapel, so we stopped at a 7-Eleven on the way. Uh, 450 takes you to Queen's Chapel from Bladensburg, and uh, when he pulled into the 7-Eleven, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we came to find out later on that he had turned his lights out, and when he pulled out of the 7-Eleven, he forgot to turn his lights on. And coming down 450, you know, during that time, it's pretty bright, and it's hard to tell, you know, if your lights are off. Uh, while we were going down one way, another car was coming up, and we didn't even know it was a police car. You know, someone was blinking their lights on and off, and we came to find out that that was a police car, and we assumed at the time that it was someone saying radar ahead or something. So. He slowed down a bit, and about two or three minutes later, uh, we saw flashing lights behind us. We pulled over. One car pulled in front of us. A police car pulled directly in front of us, and another one pulled directly behind us. To go to the back of the car, put our hands on the hood, and not to move. By that time, uh, another police car had arrived. So at that time, it was, there were three police cars on the scene. Uh, there was one officer in one car, one officer in another, and so they were told the three officers there all together at that point. Uh, Officer Swartz came to me at the time and uh, frisked me. And he was frisking me pretty rough and I complained about it. I could say, hey man, you don't have to shake me down like that. Were you belligerent? No, I was not belligerent when I said that. Uh, in fact, I was scared. I mean, an experience like this to have, you know, the car pull in front of you like that, you know, I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I didn't even think about what my brother had done wrong at that point. Uh, but I think the experience of being stopped like that and, you know, there's no telling what, what, you know, what these people think you've done. So, uh, 
he commented, he said, uh, just be quiet and put your hands back on the car. I mean, you know, he, used, he raised his tone of voice, but it really wasn't hostile at that point. I mean, the exchange really wasn't that hostile. Uh, Officer Claggett ran a check on the car, found out that the tags didn't belong on the car. At that point, they decided to arrest my brother. And uh, later on, uh, they found out that the car was suspected in a B and E, a breaking and entering, and they were looking for one suspect. Uh, Officer Claggett, at that point, decided that uh, I was not wanted, so there was no need for me to be there. So he asked me where did I live. I told him I only lived about uh, two miles up the road. So at that point, uh, he decided that I should just walk home. I had just uh, I had uh, started to walk up up the uh, up, up the avenue a little bit, and Officer Claggett called me out. He said, "No, no, you come back. I'll take you down." And uh, at that point, I think it, you know his his tone of voice was hostile. I mean, it seemed like something personal. Uh, was that Claggett or Swartz? Officer Swartz. Yes, yeah, Swartz. He called me back, and he proceeded to strip. I mean. Uh, Fritz searched me again in the same manner. I didn't say anything at that time. You know, I kind of like looked over my brother like that, you know, like, you see what this guy's doing, you know. He put the handcuffs on me and placed me in a police car, his police car, in the front seat. Another officer, I don't know his name. At that time, there were about six officers present. Uh, another couple police cars had arrived on the scene. Uh, one of them at least occupied two officers. Uh, they came to the passenger side of the window and started to talk to me and ask me did I know where my brother was. I told them I had no idea where he was. They didn't believe that. And then an officer made a threat to me to do the effect that, uh, well, maybe you'll start remembering if you would send you down Boys Village and you'd be somebody's old lady overnight. And I, I laughed at that, but it was at that point, I think my laughter was nervousness. I think it was trying to project to them that I wasn't afraid. Uh, but, I mean, had I known anything at that point, uh, I don't think that, you know, uh, these type of tactics would have worked with me at that point. I didn't think I deserved to be handcuffed. I didn't think I deserved to be taken to the police station in this manner. And uh, they started to laugh, and they said, you think you're real tough, don't you? I didn't say anything. I just, you know, sat in the police car. I didn't say anything. And then the officer said, just take him on down. And he pulled off on the way to the police station. Uh, I made a comment to Officer Swartz. I said, uh, uh, I was a little irritated at that time. I said, I hope you're right about what you're doing, because if you're not, my mother's probably going to sue you. And uh, he said, if you want your teeth, you better keep your mouth shut. And uh, I didn't say anything to him the rest of the way down. When we got to the police station, <clears throat> Excuse me. When we got to the police station, there were several people walking around in the processing area. I remember a white girl, a uh, uh, younger white male, he was walking around. You can tell they were civilians the way they were dressed. This one white guy seemed to be key, carefree, you know, free living, you know. And uh, he offered me a cigarette at the time. And Officer Swartz intervened. No, he doesn't get anything. He don't get nothing. And I was handcuffed to a chair. And I was, I sat at the table for about an hour before he came back into the room. And the, the white male that was in there, he asked me, he said, what is this all about? Why is he treating you like that? And I did like this, like, you know, just, I don't know. Were they about your age or your brother's age? Who was uh, two, three years older than you were? They seemed to be teenagers. Uh, I couldn't, you know, say they were 15 or 16. They seemed to be teenagers, though. Uh, the thing that struck me at that point, though, was that uh, he started telling me what he was there for. He was there for trespassing. And, and I started thinking in my mind, well, what am I doing handcuffed? And these people are walking around like this. You know? And you were there for what purpose? I was not charged with anything at that point. They had never intended on charging me with anything at that point. They brought you there so your mother could come get you. The only reason I was there was to process me. You know, to ask me a few questions, where I live, who my mother was, what's her phone number, call her and have her come pick me up.
this was the only reason why I was there. Well, you were never charged. Right? I think it's important that that's emphasized because of the misconceptions that, you know, that have been created through some of the reporting in the past. The reporting initially was that I was being booked. I was being fingerprinted. That an officer was calling records or something like that. That was not true. Uh, I was not being processed for any crime. And, uh, okay. but getting on with the story, uh, I sat there in the chair. I didn't say anything to my brother. He was within speaking distance. I really didn't have hold a conversation with this white male that was standing there. Uh, I just sat there patiently and, you know, I was irritated. I mean, I felt like I, I shouldn't have been handcuffed to this chair like this and made to wait. And I felt like I should have been given the opportunity to call my mother at that point to let her know where I was or my father. Officer Swartz came back into the processing room uh, about an hour later. We sat at the table. He looked at me, I looked at him, and he put his head down and started writing something on a form on a piece of paper. He asked me my name. I gave him my name. He said, spell it. And I spelled it for him. And he said, uh, where'd you live at? And I gave him my address. And at that point, his, my, my answers were not quick enough. And he, you know, he said something to the effect that, uh, what you can't talk, and uh, I just nodded my head, like, yes, I can talk. And uh, then he said, uh, move your chair back. And uh, before I can move my chair back, I mean, when he said move your chair back, he said, move your chair back, your breath stinks. So before I can move my chair back, he kicked the chair in between me, you know, in between the chair, and I fell down, and I hit my head on the floor and I got back up. I was stunned at that point when he did that. I couldn't believe he did that in front of these people and my brother was in there and that upset him. He was hollering at that point, saying, hey, you can't do that, you can't do that. So I just picked my chair up and I just gave him one of those stares, like, you know, don't do that no more. And uh, I placed my chair back and I really didn't try to sit that close to him. I tried to keep it on a leg distance. So uh, he began asking me questions again and uh, where I lived at. I think we had left off where I lived at. And uh, before I could even answer him again, he looked at me. He said, didn't I tell you to move your chair back? And he, and he kicked the chair again and I fell down. And I got up and I was like, you know, I mean, I was frustrated at that point. I mean, it was nothing I could really do. I was handcuffed. I mean, this was a police officer. I mean, there were people in there. I mean. This guy was bigger than I was. I mean, fighting someone at that point never really entered my mind. It was, you know, it was a hopelessness there, you know. Was, what can you do? So I got up and I looked at him. My brother was, I mean, he was going crazy in there. You know, you can't do that, you know. You can't put your hands on him like that. And um, I got up and I said to him, I said, don't do that no more. Please don't do that no more. I haven't, I haven't put my hands on you. I haven't done anything to you. Don't do that to me. I mean, I tried to speak firmly about it, and uh, he looked at me, said, who do you think you're talking to? And uh, before I could react, he backhanded me, and I kind of like, you know, it wasn't a, you know, he didn't get me, you know, I mean, it wasn't a solid hit, because I kind of like moved my head a little bit. So I was crying at that point, and I was saying, you can't do this. I, was, I remember myself crying and saying, you can't do this, you can't do this. I kept saying this over and over in my mind. And uh, he said, uh, well, what's your mother's name? And I think I said Helen or something. And uh, I think I gave her a name. I don't remember whether or not I gave her a name. He said, what? I said, and, you, know, I, I, you know, I was sobbing it. So I mean, he, he might not have understood what I was saying. And uh, that's when he said, uh, he, said something to, he said something to me and I couldn't really understand it, but before I could even say anything or look up, that's when he kicked me again. And this time he kicked me, he kicked me in the groin and I fell back and, you know, all I could feel was, you know, the pain. And I didn't even really think that time. I mean, I just 
picked up my, I tried to pick up my, I had the chair hand. I tried to pick up the chair and swing it at him. But before I could do that, you know, several officers converged on me and knocked me into a corner. And an officer had his knee in my neck. You know, I had his knee pressing down on the bone in my neck. And that's nothing you can really do at that point. My arm was twisted on the chair. I mean, I was just subdued at that point. There was nothing I could do. I wasn't resisting. Uh, I wasn't saying anything. I mean, I was hollering, you know, other than hollering. But I wasn't resisting at that point. Uh, whatever my intentions were at that point, when I picked up the chair, I wasn't doing any of that at that point. The officer continued to press down on my neck. And, you know, the thing that hurt the most between that and the, my arm twisted up is these officers were kicking me and stomping me and hitting me with their fists. And, uh, I mean, they were hitting me so much that they started hitting each other, you know. All of them were, I, I couldn't tell how many officers there were at that point. But my brother was saying it was like five or six of them in there at that point. So an officer said, take, take the handcuffs off, take the handcuffs off of them. I'm going to break this little black, you know, MF's neck. And uh, they took the handcuffs off of me. And uh, somebody picked me up from the back, back of my shirt, picked me straight up and took me and just ran my face straight into the wall and bounced me back off. Somebody opened the door, threw me in the room. And then this, who I, I mean, I didn't know who it was at the time. It was Officer Claggett. He started throwing me around and I bounced off a table a couple times and he came at me and he just started beating me on my head. And my face was like into his chest. And he just started beating me on his feet, beat me on my head, beat me. And I, could, I could, like, at that point, feel something coming down. You know, it's like water or something. What was that? Blood. My head, I had come to find out later on, and I had a big gaping hole in the back of my head. So he just kept beating me. And then he, you know, then at that point, I bit him in the chest. And he, he you know, he still didn't stop, he still didn't stop beating me. And I just bit him harder, and then he kneed me. He kneed me up like in the stomach area. And when he did that, the force of that, the force of that, of that blow, uh, I think at that point, my hand was on his gun. And when he did that, the force pulled the gun out. And it didn't even come out of his holster normally. I mean, from what I understand, I think it was ripped out. And that pulled me back. And I stepped back and I looked at him and I had the gun. And I, I you know, it was like, I wasn't even myself at that point. I mean, it wasn't like I took the gun and pointed it directly at him. You know, I was like, I remember myself being down like this with the gun. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you black motherfucker. And he came at me. And between the time I pulled the gun and the time he looked at me, I say about 15 seconds elapsed. And for me, in my mind, I felt like, I never really intended to shoot this, uh, this officer. The only thing I wanted to do was stop him from beating me like this. And uh, he, when he lunged at me, that's when I pulled the trigger and the bullet shot him. The bullet hit him in the stomach. He crouched over and I was scared out of my mind at that point. I thought that that didn't do anything to him. I turned around, opened the door and just ran out. The next thing I remember was running into a steel door. I just ran straight into a steel door and fell down. Uh, Several people were jumping on me, and people were trying to put handcuffs on me, and you know they beat me some more in the, hall, in the hallway, and then they dragged me back down the hall, you know, by the handcuffs. They just dragged me straight back down, and when I got back in the uh, in the room, they beat me some more in there, and uh, it was just like this one black officer there, and I just thought that, you know. I mean, all up to this point, I had not even seen one black person in there. Then at this point, I thought that maybe he could stop them from beating me like this. And he just looked at me and just turned his head and walked away and while they went in beating him and my brother, my brother. So you have no recollection of what happened from the time you hit that steel door and the time you fired that shot? No, no none, none whatsoever. Um, and that was during the time that Officer Swart that was during the time when they claimed that I supposedly shot Officer Swartz. But uh, I've lived just a long time now, and I've never, ever remembered shooting that. Uh, even when I was being transport, transported to the detective agency in Forestville, 
I said and while I was sitting in the police car, I hope he's all right, and I met Officer Claggett. He said, what do you mean, him? It's two of them. Two of them are dead. And I started crying. I said, oh, my God. And I started crying. I said, two of them. I mean, I was, I could, you know, it was just total disbelief at that point. And uh, I spent, you know, like 14, 15 hours in the detective agency. Uh, at that point, I had not even talked to anyone in my family. Uh, Did Melvin know where you were? Had they told him? Yeah, they had taken both of us to the detective agency at that point. And I was chained to a, you know, to a floor. I was placed in a chair in my one hand and one leg was chained. Uh, see, the thing, the, when I was brought into the, the detect detective agency, the Prince George's County Police Officer transported me. And when he was bringing me in, in the station, he had his hand up on top of my, my shoulder blade, and he was like one of those pensions, you know, it was like you really can't move when you do it. And this is the way he walked me into the, into the station. So when I sat down and the detective came in there, and he said, uh, you got anything to say? And I said, I, you know, I, I started to explain to him what had happened, you know, thinking that he would, he would listen to me. And uh, he said, look, you have to do more than that. I said, I didn't do nothing. I said, you know, I tried to explain to him what these officers had done to me. And he said, look, you either going to talk to us now or we're going to send you back out there with that officer. And he was speaking of the one I was just explaining brought me in there. So uh, I started to give a statement at that point. And one officer was very friendly with me, and I got this, this other officer standing on the side, supposedly waiting to tear my head off. And, uh, you know, it makes sense to me now, but during that time, I had never even been in college. I mean, I had never been locked up. I had never even been handcuffed. I had never even been to a police station. Uh, the most serious altercation in my life up to that point were a couple fights when I was younger. And uh, this was just totally new to me, you know, the, the good guy, the good cop and the bad cop, you know, type of scene that they were, you know, playing out here. And uh, what I would, when I would make a statement about what happened, this one of the officers would change it, you know, make it seem as though, you know, what they were doing to me in the station wasn't as brutal. It, it was the state's uh, position, I believe, that no beatings took place until after the shootings. That was the contention they were trying to make. That was the contention that they tried to make, that I was being processed, that there was no beating. Uh, that I just, out of the blue, uh, jumped up, grabbed the policeman, policeman's officer's gun, and shot him. That's not me. And when they began to talk to people that knew me, they knew that that, that was not Terrence. They knew that that was not me, that I would not do anything like that. Uh, I was not charged with anything. I had no, no fear of, I mean, other than the fact of the way they were treating me, I had no fear of going to jail. I think the only thing I feared was the fact that I made it out there alive. That is Terrence Johnson's account about what happened on June 26, 1978, after he and his brother Melvin were stopped by police somewhere along here on Annapolis Road. Now Johnson was indicted on 11 counts in the case. The following March, he was convicted of manslaughter and the illegal use of a handgun. He was sentenced to 25 years in jail. Terrence Johnson was 16 years old. Tomorrow, on an evening exchange special, we'll take a look at juveniles and the adult penal system. We'll hear more from Terrence Johnson. He'll tell us what it was like growing up in jail, and he'll talk about his hopes and dreams for the future. I'm Gia Hinton for Evening Exchange.